I want to thank everybody for coming here this evening. For those that don't know me, my name is Brian Watson, and I'm the founder of the Opportunity Coalition. I also want to acknowledge some of our advisory board members that we have. Uh, we have Kyle Henderson. Kyle, can you raise your hand? And do we have anybody else here right now? John Brackney. Where's John? I know I saw him somewhere. John Brackney. So thank you both for your service. Appreciate that. So before we get started, I founded the Opportunity Coalition for just that purpose, to create opportunity for the people of Colorado. I grew up on the Western Slope, and what I've noticed is that sometimes our state can be disconnected. People know each other, whether they live on the Western Slope, the mountain region, or the Front Range. And I've been fortunate and blessed to meet a lot of great people. And so we bring those individuals here, people that have great stories, golden nuggets of wisdom that they can share with other people that we can learn from. And our goal here is that not only do you walk away with a little more knowledge that may apply to whatever it is that you might be doing in your own life, but that you can also meet some wonderful people. And our hope is that new employees will be found New companies will be started, and new initiate, initiatives uh, will be moved forward by people that meet here. And it's already been done, and we've already had just a great, exciting uh, benefit across the state, and we want to keep that up. So tonight, I'm thrilled to have Doug Simmons, the president of Enstrom Candies, address the Opportunity Coalition. One reason is that Enstrom's is a legendary Colorado candy maker and successful multi-generational family business. So all of us entrepreneurs can learn from their experience. The second reason is that I graduated from Olathe High School, an hour south of Grand Junction. How many people have been to Olathe? Only once, one twice. How many people knew they were driving through a town when they went through Olathe? Yeah, not too many. So Olathe, my little town, we didn't even have a stoplight. And Grand Junction, well, that was the big city. That's where we went back to school shopping at the Mesa Mall. And so we're honored that uh, they would come here tonight. Now a little bit about Doug before he comes up. He was born in London, England, and immigrated to the United States in 1957, where his family settled in the Denver area. In 1973, he came to Grand Junction, or went to Grand Junction, to attend Mesa College to study music and theater. It was there he met Jamie Enstrom Simmons while playing in the Mesa College concert band. Is that true now? Or we're still following? Okay, if I see you guys start to twitch or anything, I know that this is incorrect, so I want to make Just sure. Just watch Jamie more than Doug. I'm going to do that. Jamie, I've got you. Okay. Come kick me if you need to. And they were married in 1977. He was employed at Coors Porcelain Company for about three years in Golden, Colorado. In the spring of 1979, Doug and Jamie decided to move back to Grand Junction to join Jamie's parents in the family business, Enstrom Candies. He attended the Retail Confectioners International Candy School in 1982, making him the first in the company to have official candy making training. Doug spent his formative years in the confectionery industry working in all areas of the business under the watchful tutelage of founder Chet Enstrom and his son, Emil. In 1987, Doug became president of the company, and in 1993, Doug and Jamie purchased the business to become the third generation owners. Doug has turned a mom and pop business into a competitive, high quality producer of confections. Under his leadership, two manufacturing facilities and corporate offices have been constructed. He has also brought innovation through the technological advancements to both mail order and manufacturing sides of the business, having assisted in the development of cutting edge machinery to allow for con continuous production of Enstrom's premier product, world famous, world famous almond toffee. Okay. Now I know on your name tags we talked about what is your favorite candy as a child. We all know what our favorite candy as an adult is. Enstrom's toffee. Good. I want to make sure we do that again. Doug is also known for being very involved in the candy industry. Serving as board member for the Retail Confectioners International from 1991 to 2000, Doug was named president for the 1999 to 2000 year term. He is currently on the National Confectioners Association Advisory Board and also served from 2005 to 2008. He has also been active in the Western Candy Conference, serving on the board and is past convention chair and is a past president. 
So with that, please help me welcome Doug. Thank you, Brian. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, we're, we're just excited to have this opportunity to talk to you folks and bring a little uh, Western Slope, uh, uh, you know, skill to the, to the event. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, Brian, I really need to thank you. Uh, I, I had a conflict and Brian moved the date up, so we're actually on the second Thursday this month, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, Stephen Keating, uh, thank you for all your help. and. Uh, in getting me straightened out and getting me here on time, so I appreciate that. Uh, with me tonight is uh, is is my uh, my lovely bride, Jamie, of 37 years. She's my best friend, my business partner, <laughs> and my grounding post. We've got the fourth generation of candy craftsmen with us uh, tonight as well, with my my eldest son, uh, Doug Jr., and his. Uh, well, and his younger brother, Jim, and uh, we're happy to have them here as the oncoming fourth generation in our candy company. Uh, with Doug tonight is his girlfriend, Mary-Kate Flaherty, and I do have to say, Mary-Kate works right here in this area at the uh, Panorama Corporate Center, and she's a, an award-winning trader at Charles Schwab. She made the uh, platinum, platinum, platinum. Me, platinum level uh, of the Chairman's Club this year, and so Mary-Kate is just a go-getter, and she's, uh, she's just right around the corner if you need a really good trader. <laughs> also with us tonight is my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, Rick and Linda Enstrom. And, uh, you know, the Rick and Linda don't need much of an introduction over here because uh, they've been over here since 1985, and they have done a magnificent job of representing Enstrom Candies on the Front Range. And uh, I like to, Linda is in charge of the, she's really our, our regional manager of all retail operations. And uh, I think Linda really is the executive vice president of happiness over here. <laughs> Anybody that's had, had uh, contact with Linda at any of our stores knows that uh, if you deal with Linda, when you're done, you're going to be very, very happy. So we like that a lot. And of course now Rick is... Uh, Rick's the rabble rouser, or should I say, he's the uh, he's the uh, he, he's he's public affairs, and uh, so, so some of you know that ran uh, for office with him a couple years ago, uh, on on the wrong side of the deal because none of them got in. But uh, anyway, uh, more about Rick in a little bit. So very happy to be here, and I, I know you're happy to have us here for one reason, because. We have candy. <laughs> yeah. Now, this isn't just any candy. This is the finest product of its kind anywhere in the world. And that's important because we want you to be happy when you, when you uh, eat it and enjoy it and send it uh, to friends, etc. But that's not all that's in this box. More of what's in this box is really a legacy. A legacy of leadership and entrepreneurism, craftsmanship, dedicated dedication to community, and, and just numerous things that you can, you can imagine that are in this box. And so with that, I want to give you a little history uh, about Enstrom Candies and how we got here and uh, why we're going to continue on. So, in 1902, Chet Enstrom, Chester Kermit Enstrom, Chet, as a nickname, was born uh, just outside of uh, Galesburg, uh, Illinois. His, he would, he's a first generation American. His parents were Swedish immigrants. Uh, his father was in farming and they moved around quite a bit. He ended up uh, working as a salesman for dairy equipment. And then uh, during that period of time, uh, when Chet was a young man, his father contracted tuberculosis. And because of that, they moved out to Colorado Springs for the, the altitude and the dry air and hopefully keep, keeping them healthy. Well, uh, that worked for a little while until uh, at the age of uh, when Chet was 15, his father passed away. And so because of that, Chet had to begin working. He worked summers during high school at a confectionery and uh, ice cream plant in Colorado Springs called Barthel's. 
uh, owned and operated by a man named Walter Barthel. So, as time went on, uh, Chet ended up really needing to work more because of the family issues. And so, he quit high school and went to work at Barthel's full time. <clears throat> and that was in about probably um, 1919, 1920. And so Chet was, uh, he was making ice cream, but he was always looking at the, at the candy kitchen because they made candy as well. And Chet was always jealous of the candy makers, so he would hurry to get his ice cream done and work that shift on the ice cream plant, and then he would want to go work with the candy makers. And he always told the story that Mr. Barthel said, well, you know, you've already worked your shift and you're tired, so I'm going to pay you half wages if you're back there in the candy plant. So <laughs> I don't think you could get away with that today. So. But anyway, so Chet, uh, was, he, he really was intrigued with the candy making. And he began working with the candy makers every chance he got. And eventually, uh, one of the candy makers quit, and Chet began making candy on a regular basis. He had his little black book that we still have today where he was taking notes and writing down recipes and figuring all this stuff out. But, and he still worked on the ice cream side as well. But he just had this fascination with candy. And it's, uh, it's, uh, candy making can be very artistic when you think of hard candies and candy canes and a lot of the, the very attractive candies. And Chet was artistic and he loved that candy making. And during that period of time, a gentleman by the name of Harry Jones was a traveling salesman he came through and he was, he was selling them uh, dairy products, et cetera, for the, uh, for the uh, ice cream. And he got to know Chet. He liked Chet's business or work ethic. It just, it just, and they started to kindle a, a relationship. Also during that same period, Mr. Barthel took a liking to Chet. And he would take Chet with him on big ice cream deliveries. And in fact, uh, rumor has it that he would take him to the bank with him on occasion where Mr. Barthel would either have his deposit in his coat or maybe even under his hat. And so, you know, Chet really liked that because he thought, uh, he thought, you know, I'd like to have a business and I'd like to take money to the bank one day. Well, anyway, uh, he and Harry Jones got to talking and they decided that they were going to go into business together and they were looking for a good location. There were some uh, small creameries and stuff for sale. And they found one in Grand Junction, and they decided to move to Grand Junction. So in 1929, Chet and Vernie Enstrom, uh, and, and their two kids, Anne and Emil, Emil was one year old at the time, they loaded up the Model A, and they drove through the muddy, rut-filled roads. It took them two days to get to Grand Junction. And they got to Grand Junction in 1929, and formed the Jones Enstrom Ice Cream Company. So we all know what happened in 1929. So they get there and start a business and the, the whole country fell apart with the depression. But they, they continued on. While, while Chet was at Barthel's, he also learned something about refrigeration engineering and he could fix these, the old ammonia and refrigeration systems. So in those early years, uh, from 29 and in the early 30s, they made ice cream, they sold it locally, and they had a pretty good business because they were distributing it around, maybe even to Olathe. Okay. Just a real quick side note, you know, my claim to fame in Olathe is the one time I think I stopped there. I was with a group of grungy musicians that I was playing with, and we opened at the Corn Fest for Bachman Turner Overdrive. <laughs> yes. There you go. But anyway, so they were, they were doing pretty well. They were uh, delivering ice cream around. They had a little ice cream shop on the front of the ice cream factory. And Chet would uh, moonlight and he would fix the refrigeration systems in the area and get those running and help people do that. And they did pretty well. Well, Chet never forgot about the candy making. And so he always made candy as a hobby. And in the 30s, uh, he would... He would he, taught the housewives in the, in, in the neighborhood how to dip chocolates. And so Chet would make some centers, he'd buy the chocolate, and then he would give them lessons and teach them how to hand dip chocolates. And hand dipping chocolate is, is kind of technical because you have to temper the chocolate because if you don't get it just right, it'll turn gray, the cocoa butter comes to the surface and they all look ugly. Anyway, so he was doing that and they thought, well, what would we do? Well, let's make some candy. And they, he was also in the Grand Junction Lions Club and they thought, well, we'll have a candy booth at the Lions Carnival. And so he had Harry Benj that owned a shoe store, save the shoe boxes, and they cut the shoe boxes down to about the size of the lid. 
and they made chocolates and had all these ladies dipping and everything. Then they packed the shoe boxes, wrapped them, gift wrapped them, and then they raffled them off at the Lions Club Carnival. And so not only is he, is he he's in business and he's making ice cream, and now he's making candy as a hobby, and he's also now beginning the philanthropy that he's well known for because he started, he's in, in community involvement and what have you. And so he had spent some time on the uh, Chamber of Commerce in Grand Junction. In the later 30s, he was elected to city council and in 1939 became the mayor of Grand Junction. And so, you know, what's in this box here is a leg legacy of community service as well. It's not just the finest ingredients you can buy, it's community service. And it's, and, and this is, you know, th that check started to lead the way that showed us the way on how to operate a business and how to be community minded and, and operate and, and do a good job, be a good employer and participate in your community. Uh, through the 40s, they, uh, they uh, rumbled along, you know, during the war years, sugar and butter were being rationed and what have you, so uh, they just continued on. They made ice cream through the 40s, and as they get into the 50s, things were starting to lighten up a little bit, and Chet was uh, still dabbling in the candy, and a Greek salesman came through, and he showed him a piece of candy, and it was a piece of toffee, but it was really just plain butter toffee to be used in ice cream. As a, as a butter brickle or a, a toffee vanilla ice cream. And he gave Chet the recipe for the toffee. And Chet started messing with this toffee. And he's, he's going along, he's making it for the ice cream, and he's, he's thinking, you know, this might be good with a little chocolate on it or whatever, or maybe some nuts in it or nuts on it. And he started developing this toffee. And in the mid-50s, he actually uh, rented a space in a house that had been kind of turned into a workshop right near the ice cream plant. And he, he bought a kettle, I think he said he spent $85, and he had a, ke a, a little kettle stove. He had uh, uh, the kettle, of course, uh, and he bought a, an axe handle, uh, which, which was kind of like a candy paddle that they had at Barthel's, and it worked because they're kind of wide at the bottom, and you stir that with wood in the copper kettle. And so, and then he bought all of his ingredients through the ice cream company. And we've got the invoices and stuff where he was paying back the ice cream company for the, all the ingredients that he was taking to make candy. And so in 1954, he was literally making four or 5,000 pounds of candy in the, in the mid-50s uh, and, and giving it away to friends as gifts and what have you and, and really began to sell. People liked the candy and he started selling candy, moonlighting, while he still owned the ice cream company. And so as that went on in the later 50s, Harry Jones decided that he had an opportunity uh, to kind of uh, slow down a little bit and wanted to move to California. So he and Chet, they valued the, the ice cream business and the, Harry was gonna leave and Chet, they shook hands and Chet said, you know, if I, if I get more than this for it, I'll send you a check. If I get less, I'm gonna send you a bill. And so Harry left and Chet ended up selling the ice cream company to a larger creamery. Uh, it was Climber's Dairy at the time. And he got $10,000 more than, than they had figured the business was worth. So he sent Ch Harry a check for five grand, and evidently, we don't have it, but evidently he got a card back saying he must be the most honest man that Harry had ever met, which was really cool. So now with the ice cream business sold, and Chet making this candy and actually beginning to sell it, Everybody said, you know, you really ought to open a candy company. And so in 1960, he founded Enstrom, the Enstrom Candy Company. And right away, they tore down an old house next door to the ice cream plant, and he made the first edition in 1961, 1961-62, and built the actual first, first uh, section of the candy company. And he, he carried on and was making toffee, and he was involved in, in the ice cream uh, uh, industry and on serving on different boards and what have you so he had a lot of friends around the country and so he started sending this toffee to him he says hey I'm going to be making this toffee I'm open a business if you want to send it out to your family friends business associates whatever let me know and I'll ship you a box out and get that going so right out of the chute our business started in the mail order business and it was very clever because obviously, you know, Grand Junction was a small community at the time. You don't have that big a consumer base. And so now he's selling candy out of the community, which turned out to be a very, very good idea. And so as that went along, 
uh, in, it was business was growing. He was probably making about 30,000 pounds by about 1964-65, and that's when they tore down the ice cream plant and added the second half of the of the factory, uh, and, that, and they had a grand opening in 1965-66 time frame. Now, also in 19 in the early I think 1961, uh, he was on the he went on the CSU Board of Regents. And so, and he was on the Board of Regents from, I think, 61 to about 66. And so he was already getting some front range exposure and what have you. So in 1966, uh, a, a senator, a state senator by the name of Ed Lamb, and I'm not sure if that's any relation to Governor Lamb, I don't think it is. But um, no, he's a Republican. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so, so Ed Lamb uh, took ill in the state senate. And Governor John Love at the time asked Chet to fill his chair in the state senate. And Chet really uh, wanted to do this, and so he accepted. Now, at that time, his son and daughter-in-law, Mary and Abel Enstrom, were living in the Denver area, where Rick, being the oldest, was, Rick was born in, in Denver, uh, as well as their, their middle brother, Bill. Well, Bill was born in St. Joe, Missouri, and then Jamie was in, in Denver. So... Uh, they had three kids. Emil was also, he attended Iowa State and uh, studied dairy chemistry. And he ended up somewhat in the, in the dairy industry. He was selling milk cartons for a warehouser and traveling around. And so uh, Chet said, hey, uh, I've been asked to go to the Denver and be in the Senate. Would you guys move over and help me, help me in the candy business? Because by that time, things were starting to you know, take hold and the business was popular and what have you. And everybody loved, loved the toffee. And so, Mary and Emil decided to uh, bring the kids to Grand Junction in 1966. And so Chet left for the Senate, and Mary and Emil were there trying to figure out the candy business. <laughs> and figured out they did. Uh, and a lot of times in this, in this history, Mary and Emil get run over, uh, forgotten a little bit because they were kind of in the middle. But truth be known, they really uh, figured out how to run this business. They figured out how to nurture the mail order business. They operated and developed a high standard of business ethics and how they ran the business. And it really began to gain some prestige and, and people were noticing. And so by uh, 1970, uh, Mary and Emil bought the business from Chet and Bernie and became the second generation owners. Now, we haven't found any documentation at this point to whether there was a, an actual agreement. So we think this was another handshake deal where they came up with the value and Mary and Emil paid Chet a, uh, wrote him a check once a year, every year. And I think then it just continued on. I think they, and they, they, they helped Chet and, uh, through, their, through the years. So now we get into the 70s. And this is where Mary and Emil really began to shine. The business was really starting to grow. They were... They were, really had a good business model. They, they developed a customer service second to none, and then we still follow a lot of those, a lot of that creed today. And so uh, they really, they really did a good job. And so um, as the business was growing through the uh, 70s, uh, things would get really crazy at Christmas time. And this is where Rick brought some innovation because Rick was working in the family business at that time. And it gets crazy in the mailroom around Christmas. And there's just not enough help to slap all these labels and do all these boxes and get it all out the door. So Rick had a friend that was a Grand Junction fireman. And he, the Grand Junction Fire Department had three crews. Well, only one crew was on at the time. So there was always two crews off. And they got to talking and Rick brought in uh, the firemen that were off and they helped in the mailroom. And we used that model for a number of years with the firemen coming in, the ones that weren't working, because they got to make some extra cash for Christmas, the candy company got the mail put out, and you know, when you get a bunch of firemen going, they know what's going on. I mean, if you put a bucket line together, these guys, can, they, can, they can do the mail, let's put it that way. And so we used that model for a long time, and uh, that, was, that was great. Now, more about Rick, in 1978, Rick was elected as the youngest Mesa County Commissioner uh, in history at that time, I think in the state of Colorado, if I'm not mistaken, but certainly in Mesa County. And so Rick, uh, Rick began his career in politics at that point. The business was getting busy, um, and you know, uh, 
the folks were they didn't they didn't really know what to do they didn't want to work that hard and so one day we get the call and they said you know rick's in the he's in the county commission things are kind of busy do you guys want to come over and sell your house and come over and and uh and get in the candy business. Jamie is a nursing degree. She was uh, she was working as an orthopedic nurse at St. Joe's Hospital, and I was at Coors Porcelain Company at the time. And we decided that we we'd do it. We'd go over it. And so, spring of 1979, we joined the uh, the candy company, and it was trial by fire. We and I started learning how to make candy. I actually I was the only. Jamie was doing bookkeeping part time, and she was actually she got a job in the doctor's office helping an allergist open up his office over there because. The business probably couldn't afford both of us at the same time. And so um, Chet and Amel took me under their wing, started showing me how to make candy, etc. Jamie was learning how to do the books, and, and uh, off we went. And so we get into the 80s, and you know, things, are, uh, things are really starting to boom. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Everything, you know, there was no cell phones, there was no fax machines, there was no computers. Well, there were, there were computers these small mini computers that weren't small, they were the size of this podium, and that you know, uh, didn't do much except for have a dumb terminal and you could put data in and maybe print it out. And so uh, when we got there, the company had 10,000 customers on Rolodex cards. And, and so what they would do is they would type an envelope for each one of those customers, and we'd put an order form in there, and they'd mail it out and say September and saying, hey, Christmas season's coming, Here's your order form for toffee. Uh, get it in and get it in early so we can process it. Those orders would come back. They would, they would be batched. And we had, they had housewives working that would take a batch of orders and they'd go home and they'd add up all the candy. They'd turn it over and calculate the shipping prices for each candy, each, each package that was going out. And then they'd also uh, hand write a, a greeting card that was supposed to go with each package. Then they'd bring all that back with a stack of invoices and then that same batch of order forms then would go to the typist, and the typist would type the shipping label. And, they would, they, and then <laughs> they had half-size manila envelopes, and with a pencil, they'd write the name of the customer and each date that one of the labels or a couple of the labels was supposed to ship out of that envelope. And then they would file them in alphabetical order by customer name. And one of the first jobs, uh, file pardon me? By date. Huh? Filed by date. Oh, by date, by date. And then by customer, obviously. But, um, so one of our first jobs was to take, it, the first Christmas season, was to take these boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes home and go through these envelopes and pull out the labels that needed to ship the next day and erase that date and put it back in the file and go through all of these and pull the labels out. The next night we would do the same thing. And so you would prep every every night, you'd get all the labels out that needed to go the next day. Now, you know, as a as kind of a rock and roll guitar player, lazy guy, looking, I, I always say that lazy people are good inventors. And when we're looking at this, I'm like, there, there's got to be a better way to do this. this is <laughs> And so uh, we talked the folks into letting us send out an RFP to a couple of computer companies over here, IBM, and then uh, another company, Kimbrough Computer Sales. They were doing the uh, digital equipment systems at the time. And we, went, and we got a proposal from them where they analyzed the size of our business. And they said, yep, you need this size of computer. And it was literally about the size of this podium. And it had these big 10 megabyte disks that were metal that would you'd open the lid. And that, that's how you backed up and what have you. And there was no software at the time, so all the software had to be custom written, and it was just a data entry thing. We had like four, four dumb terminals, so that when the order forms came in, the orders came in, we could type in the, basically a label making machine. We'd type in all the information, and it would make the labels and produce an invoice. And so, uh, all of a sudden now we're starting to get into the technology to make this thing go. And in the early uh, 80s, uh, we, oh, here's the other thing that's kind of interesting. Mary Enstrom, had come December 1st, we had two phone lines. On December 1st, she'd take one of them off the hook. Because she would be damned if any phone customer is going to get in front of one of those precious mail order customers that took the time to send that order back again. And so we'd take the phone off the hook. And I'm thinking, oh, goodness, this is interesting. But anyway, so... <laughs> so so uh, we, we, in, we got our first computer system in 1982. 
And uh, so we knew we were going to be able to process a few more orders. And I convinced them that we should uh, expand the office a little bit in the back of the plant, and we put a, a, a counter across, and we put six telephones across there. And during the busy season, instead of taking the phone off the hook, we had six ladies taking orders and writing them down. So they'd write the orders down, and then they'd pass them to the other side of the office so that they could be typed in to the computer system. And I started off on a production schedule, because I'm making candy. I'm starting to get involved in the office and do all these things and, and pay attention to what's going on. But my real task was making candy. And I set off on this production schedule and started making a bunch of candy. And my father-in-law comes in just shaking his head. He looks at me and he says, you are never, you're never going to sell all this candy. I said, well, I think we can. And lo and behold, we ran out of candy that year. And we scrambled like crazy at the end of the year, making and trying to make enough candy to get it all out, and we did. And so this was 1982, and maybe you guys on the front range don't remember this, but that was also the same year that we had Black Monday over there, and that's when Exxon closed their, their uh, oil shale plant over there. And by the way, when Harry Jones and Chet Enstrom were talking about why to go to Grand Junction in 1929, it was because oil shale. There's paper article, the newspaper articles about the burning rock and how there's going to be an oil boom in, on the western slope. Well, we all know oil shales, uh, we're still working on that today. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that was one of the reasons they went to Grand Junction. So anyway, um, we're, we're going along and then Exxon pulls out. And that, that uh, year, 700 families left the Grand Junction area. Doc, you know, all these doctors that were making money, so if they were putting up buildings everywhere, Brian, <laughs> and all of a sudden, they were empty. And the, the economy was, it was, and it was localized because it, it was all on the western slope, and Grand Junction took the brunt of it. Well, during that same period, we were growing by double digits because we were exporting. Our customer base wasn't in Grand Junction. But man, I'll tell you what, we couldn't talk about it because everybody was dying on the vine over there, and here we are growing like crazy. So it was an interesting time. You know, we were, as time goes on through the 80s, um, uh, you know, the development of the, uh, well, what happened in 1985 is um, Rick finished being uh, on the county commission in 1984. No, 80, it was, yeah, 78 to 82. So it was a couple years there. And Rick and Linda said, you know, why don't we open stores over in Denver? Let's open a store in Denver. And so in 1985, Rick and Linda, uh, uh, started the first store over here, and we did it at the Tivoli Center down by uh, uh, Metro State College, and that ended up being their student center. It never really did take off as a mall, but it was our first opportunity to advertise and have a presence in the Denver area, and that was uh, it was an amazing thing to do because because you know we were really pretty isolated in Grand Junction. We didn't really have a, 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 a any reason to advertise over here. We couldn't really afford to advertise over here because it was an expensive, larger market and what have you. But when we opened the store over here, it gave us a reason to advertise and, and start to tap the Denver market. And things continued to grow. Uh, we ended up uh, at the Tivoli for a little while, and then we, then we opened our first store down in Cherry Creek, where in the same location it is today, but we, we moved up and expanded the store uh, a number of years ago. But because of that Denver effort at that time, the business really continued to grow and grow. Now, during that same period when we opened the store, the fax machine had just been invented. And, and so we, we put our first fax machine in to get the orders that they would take at their store to send over to Grand Junction to be processed because we shipped it, we still stored and shipped all the main, did all the mail order from Grand Junction. That's where the computer system was. And so they would uh, take orders during the day and they would fax them. And my father-in-law, Emil, I, I remember, he's just going, how the heck do they send that through the phone? I just, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so we're, you know, so, well, so we're, we're using this for a business reason to get the orders from the Denver store. We're thinking, well, what happens if we put the fax number on our order form and send it out? Because people are going to start having fax machines. Well, as this went along, all of a sudden, if you'll remember the old fax machines that were the thermal paper, and they'd, they'd print it out, and then they'd slice it off, and it'd just, you know, go into a little basket and be all curled up. 
we'd come in in the morning during the first holiday season where we put the fax number on that order form, and we'd come in and there would be a pile of curly paper on the door. And, you know, so it was a blessing and a curse all at the same time because people thought this is great. And yeah, I don't know if you're, you guys are much for handwriting, but a lot of our customers aren't very good at handwriting. And, then, and it's even worse when you put it on a fax on curly paper that's heat sensitive that if you touch it, you can, you can draw a line through it with your fingernail, you know? And so here we are trying to scramble through all these orders and we are just getting inundated. And once again, the business is just taking off again. We're growing like crazy because, uh, number one, the best product money can buy right here. The best ingredients, you know, uh, nothing but love in here. And so, and, and you know, and Enstrom at Toffee at that point was becoming a tradition, uh, not only in Colorado, but around the country, and in fact, some international at that point. And so, uh, it, it, so fax machines, you know, 800 numbers. Now, all now we can just before that we can pay to have you call us, so the call's free. We've got the phone bank. We've got the computer system. Well, I call it a computer system. Uh, just a segue into that. I, I this is one of those deals where you couldn't be entering data at the same time you were processing and printing labels and invoices. So that had to happen at night. And so we'd enter all this data in there, and then. Uh, at night, I would go down and I'd do the processing runs for the next day. And, you know, this was archaic software. It was all homegrown. It was, you know, I had programmers that were trying to fix this code and that code and things would hiccup and the, the, the disk drives weren't that classy at that time. So we'd start this big processing run and it'd blow up. <laughs> and the only way to start it again is to get out the disks. I had five of these big disks in a rack, and I'd get the disks out and I'd plunk them down, and I'd open up the lid, and one at a time, I would restore all the data. And then I'd cross my fingers, say a prayer, and I'd start it again. And see, and a lot of times it would go through, a lot of times it would blow up again. And there was one night that I was down there at three o'clock in the morning, and it kept blowing up. I was sick, and it was raining like hell out, and we had this aluminum awning in front of the store windows. And the, the thunderstorm came through and it picked up that awning and dropped it down and crashed through the windows. And I called Jamie, the computer's blown up, I'm sick, and the rain is just coming in the store. And I said, I want to come home. <laughs> you know, but those are the good old days. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we got through all of that, and we as we as we start to get into the 90s, it's interesting to, to tell you that we had a website before Amazon was a company. And it wasn't a fancy one, it was just an electronic catalog. You could look at it, but then you had to call us and say, hey, what, what's that? And you know, whatever, we could just, it was just an electronic catalog. But the internet kind of came along. And as that, as that started to develop, once again, this technology, we were just kind of in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. And now you can order through the internet. And we started to take off like crazy. And one of my uh, former CFOs, he says, you know, this is kind of funny. He says, we're actually a technology company that happens to sell candy. And uh, he was, it was really true because we, you know, I, I didn't mention credit card or, uh, cards earlier, but you know everybody used to send a check in with their order. But as we opened up the phone system, the cre credit card revolution was happening, and so now you can spend your money over the phone. You could put your credit card on the on the order form and send it in, etc. And so all of this technology and all these steps kept coming along, and we were just in the right place at the right time, and business continued to flourish. And uh, you know, and so. Uh, we go through the 90s and business is really growing. I think by, uh, uh, Jamie and I did buy the company in 1993. Uh, unfortunately, two months after we purchased the company, uh, Mary Enstrom passed away, uh, kind of unexpectedly, but she did have a, she had an artificial heart valve. She passed away uh, uh, in 1993. Chet had preceded her in death. Her, her grandfather, or her father-in-law, Chet Enstrom, uh, died in uh, 1992 at the age of 89. But uh, through, through all of that, Chet and Vernie and Mary and Emil taught us business ethics, community leadership, 
philanthropy, and all those things. And we, we all, as, uh, as the kids, Rick and Linda and Jamie and I, we all learn together uh, what it really takes to not just run a business and try to make a buck and run something up, a, up, up you know, and try to sell it and go do something else. We, have, we, we had a legacy business going on here. We had a business that was worthy of making a transition to the next generation. And so we had a, a, a real responsibility, and Jamie and I have talked about this a lot. We, fig we think it's our responsibility, and it's just our time to carry the torch and try to do a good job and try to leave it in a better, in better condition in which we found it and pass it on. And that's basically where we are today. Um, as we, uh, let's see, late 90s, I'm just trying to go through the decades here and try to remember some things. Uh, Rick and Linda were well established in the Denver area at this time. We uh, opened another store out in the Lakewood area uh, somewhere in the 90s and we had two stores going over here. Things were great. Uh, Rick, as you well know, Rick makes friends like crazy. And he, I think he knows half the people in Denver, all, all two million of them, whatever. But uh, at that point, five million, no, only, only half, Rick, not all of them. <laughs> uh, in 1999, Rick was appointed by Governor Owens to the uh, State Wildlife Commission, where he served two terms, and I think you were chairman twice, two years. And, uh, and so, you know, we're, we we're following Chet's lead into community participation and politics and, and, and service to the, to the community and all those things. And that, to me, I think is what, what is our legacy is all about. It's a legacy of, of quality. It's a legacy of entrepreneurship. It's a legacy of community service. And, and uh, it's all right in here. So as we get into the 2000s, the 2000s were interesting. Probably by uh, the late 90s, we were, we were probably at that point, uh, had, had just exceeded a million pounds of production mm -hmm. at that time. Is that right? No, I'm sorry. I think by that time it was a million dollars in sales. Uh, yeah. And, you know, so uh, we didn't break a million pounds, I don't think, until in the early 2000s. Um, but we just continued on, and we were going along, and you know, I was thinking, man, this is this is pretty good. I'm a smart guy. <laughs> and we get to uh, we get to 2006, and I stumbled across a deal, and I, I don't I don't know how's my time, Brian? How are we looking? Four minutes. Yeah, uh, I, I stumbled across a deal that well, we knew it, you know there was there was like three or four companies in the state of Colorado. There was us, Enstrom on the west side. There was Hammonds. And Chet and Amel were really good friends with Tommy Hammond. So there was Hammond Candies. Now that's been sold a couple of times, and you guys are familiar, probably familiar with Hammonds now. And then there was also uh, Stephanie's. And the, the Poulos brothers owned Stephanie's Chocolates, and they were famous for the Denver Mint and what have you. And um, um, another gentleman came along and bought Stephanie's from the Poulos brothers. And he kind of, to our consternation, uh, started making Colorado almond toffee. You know, but in honesty, it wasn't that good. <laughs> anyway, and the proof's in the pudding because in 2006, Stephanie's went bankrupt. And I stumbled across, I didn't really know this was happening. I was just in the right time at the right place and found out they were going to auction off the assets to Stephanie's and I showed up at the auction at the bank, unannounced. And one thing led to another, and I was the successful bidder. And I bought the assets to Stephanie's Chocolates, which was the Stephanie's Chocolates brand, the Denver Mint brand, and Colorado Almond Toffee, which was kind of the, the driving force behind that. I wanted to have that brand. And so the landlord's at the auction, and I was successful. And he says, look, we need to talk because I own the building that they're operating in. And I said, and, and the plant was intact in there, and there were people waiting in the wings maybe to come back and bring that plant back to life. And they had been doing some nice wholesale business with Safeway, some of the other, uh, some of the larger outlets. And so he says, uh, I need you to sign a 10-year lease. And I said, you know, I, I've owned this for five minutes. I'm not signing a 10-year lease. <laughs> Uh, I said, we're going to have to talk about this. And so we, we left the bank, and I'm, I'm still scratching my head and wondering what I've just done. And because I, I paid a million four for the assets at Stephanie's, because I, before that I called the banker. I said, I'm going to this auction. I don't know what's going to happen, but I think I've got some room here, don't I? <laughs> so I, uh, we, end up, we end up with that. 
And I, the, the landlord was being very stubborn. I said, look, I, I am not, if you don't, if you either sell me this building or I'm gonna close it down right now and, and move the equipment out. So I spent another $3 million on the building. During this time, I, previous to this, I had always dreamt and, and thought about, could we develop a system that would make our almond toffee continuously? Because there's some real advantages to that if you can have a nice warm slab of toffee coming down a line of equipment where you can cut it to size and then you can completely enrobe it. And when, because this toffee, our premier product, is made in big slabs and you broke it and it has the open edge and the oxygen can get to the butter fat very easily. Cocoa butter is a very stable fat. And so when you put a piece of toffee inside the chocolate and have the chocolate keeping that toffee fresh, it's your first package. So now, uh, if we could get to that point, because we were doing some stuff where we would pour a slab of toffee out and we'd take a, 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 you know, a gang cutter and we'd roll it through and we'd cut it into squares and we'd run them through the, the chocolate car wash and we'd make toffee squares. <laughs> and we discovered that they were lasting a very long time because the toffee was staying fresh inside the chocolate. And so I wanted to figure out how to do this. So, at the same time, as, uh, as the Stephanie's purchase, I was already underway in working with a company out of Holland to help us design a machine that would cook toffee continuously. And they proved to me that they could do it. I was over there for a while and they proved that they could do it and we decided to buy a prototype system. And that system was uh, um, probably a million and a half to two million dollars. And since we had just purchased the Stephanie's thing, I thought, well, we're going to be big in chocolate, so let's buy this big chocolate depositor. <laughs> this, it's a one-shot depositor, and they call it one-shot because it makes the shell and puts the truffle center in or whatever center you like at the same time because there's, a, there's 60 nozzles, but each nozzle is a pipe within the pipe. So the chocolate's in the outer pipe and the center material's in the inner pipe, and as it deposits, it starts with the shell and then continues with the shell and puts the center in, and then the center stops and then the chocolate stops. And so you can do all these shell molded chocolates. So I bought another machine for another some odd <laughs> million five. And I'm, this, I'm telling you, I thought I was pretty damn smart. I'm going like, this, this is easy. Everything I touch is just turning the gold. <laughs> well, you all know what happened in 2008. And I look to here at the bank, and I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm the guy that's going to take this legacy business in the dirt. And damn near did. But, um, to compound that, we did get this toffee machine running. And I was convinced that it was the neatest thing since sliced bread. The toffee was very good. And I thought, well, you know, instead of breaking that up, what about if we cut pieces this size and, and we do make them about a half pound, we can put two half pound slabs in there. Beautiful, all nicely enrobed and coated with nuts and the whole bit. And we got to going in the lawn. And what we didn't realize, when we make our toffee by hand, and I'm sorry, I, I, there's a little bit of detail here, but we pour it out on the slab, and then we spread it to about one nut thick, and then we cut it into five big pieces, and then we flip the pieces over and, do, and, and, and roll it a little bit, push them back together. They're still, it's still kind of warm, so you can bend it and what have you, and it'll stick back together. Well, that whole process, we didn't realize, is that the tables are cool. They have cool water running in them. And so the skin on the toffee gets brittle. And as you pick it up and bend it, you're actually fracturing it. And you're putting a bunch of cracks in the surface and what have you. And what we found on the machine, we thought we were doing a great job. And we made a lot of product and we put it in the freezer. The toffee never gets turned over on the machine. So the top is just beautifully smooth and buttery. And, in, and when you freeze it, you get a, a, a difference in the expansion and contraction rates, and the top layer of chocolate, when people would go to break it, it would just go boink. <laughs> and it was, it was different. And we shipped a bunch of this toffee because I was pretty bullheaded. I said, this dang thing is gonna work and we're gonna put it out there. And all of a sudden the phone's ringing for the wrong reason. Everybody's getting their toffee and they're going like, and here's the interesting thing. They didn't say, what did you do to your toffee? They said, what did you do to my toffee? <laughs> and by God, we figured out what was going on and we just thought, oh my gosh. We kind of figured this out halfway through, but we had so much product made, we had to ship it. 
And so we instantly went back to the kettles and started making toffee the old way <laughs> like crazy. We gave people their money back, we replaced their candy, and the whole thing. So not only was, were we up to here at the, at the bank, not only had the economy just gone south, uh, but we had a real faux pas with the quality of our product. And so, uh, you know, all's well that ends well. I, I tell you, those kinds of lessons are very valuable for everybody in business. I think we've all been there a time or two. But uh, the planets were aligning, and they were aligning <clears throat> the wrong way. <clears throat> so uh, we did make it through that. We did get the toffee machine working properly, and we figured out, we, we messed around with a lot of things, but the, the tensile strength of the chocolate on a smaller piece is a lot better than it is on a big slab. And then it, it was really, you know, as we say, problems are opportunities. And this problem caused us to go back and say, you know what, let's still make our hero toffee the way we've always done it. Let's use the machine for the wholesale business and stick Stephanie's on there, et cetera, and do smaller pieces. So we started doing that. And we developed a little two pound jar, plastic jar of, of toffee under the Stephanie's brand, and we showed it to Costco. And they went, well, we really like this. It was really selling well and everything. And in fact, corporate noticed it. And they said, you know, that's so good that we want to take it under our Kirkland Signature brand. So, uh, they're, you know, so we were producing under Stephanie's and doing some things there and doing some chocolates and what have you. And then uh, the, uh, Costco decided to take the product under their, uh, their house brand. And we did that product for a little over three years and it ended up being system-wide. And so, out of the ashes of all the mistakes I made during the mid, mid uh, uh, de first decade of, of the, the, uh, the, the 2000s, uh, we came out of that uh, in flying colors and we, we made a, a big mark. And we also learned that uh, when you couple uh, contract manufacturing or private labeling and making candy for other people under their brands, et cetera, and combine it with our, our, our treasured mail order company, that the combination is pretty darn good. And since that point in time, we have just, uh, we've really blossomed and we have a lot of opportunity uh, going on right now. The business is in good shape. Our, our, our two sons have uh, come home to the family business. Doug moved home three and a half years ago. Uh, Jim about two years ago. Uh, Jim actually, both of the boys went to DU when they graduated. When Jim graduated, he went out to a Jelly Belly and did a, a nine month internship in the marketing department at Jelly Belly and, and learned a, a lot of things about uh, making Jelly Bellies. The, the folks at Jelly Belly are dear friends of ours and, and so that was interesting. But now the fourth generation is, be, is underway. We've done, during that period of time in the mid 2000s when we were having all this trouble and the economy went south and everything, you know what happened to the value of our businesses, it went like this. Well, there's another opportunity. We used that lower valuation period to do some estate planning and do some stock transferring and take advantage of those kinds of things and, and uh, bring, start to bring in the fourth generation. So we're going and blowing today. We've got a lot of opportunity. We're making toffee on the machine like crazy. We're making our hero product like crazy. And we're just, uh, we've got a lot of uh, good things going on. And we're uh, very, just very blessed with a very sweet business. And so I'll just wrap up to tell you that um, the next time you open a box of Enstrom Almond Toffee or you're thinking about sending some to your friends or business associates, you need to remember that um, this isn't just candy. There's high quality ingredients. There's uh, very skilled craftsmen making this product. There's, it's, we're delivering at a very fair price. And we're backing it up with service second to none. And it represents a leg legacy of uh, four generations of entrepreneurship and community leadership and participation and philanthropy. And it's not just a box of candy, folks. It's Enstrom World Famous Almond Toffee. Before we open up for questions, I have a few questions for Doug, myself, and thank you for your comments. Yeah. First question I have for you, what is the biggest challenge for you as a business owner? Well, I think, you know, the biggest challenge right now is that uh, uh, there's a lot of pressure on the energy industry that, that the Western Slope depends on. Uh, we have three stores over there in the Grand Junction area, and so with the, uh, with the pressure on the energy industry, 
and the negative environment when it comes to that, and then the, the, um, the really flat economy that we have nationally uh, is, uh, you know, it just affects everybody. And so, you know, typically over the years, we, we felt that uh, candy uh, is somewhat recession resistant. It's, uh, you know, and it's kind of like a bottle of booze or six pack of beer, a box of candy. It's one of those small gifts that, you know, when hard times come and you're not going to be out there buying a new car or a new washing machine or things like new house or something like that, but you're going to make yourself happy with a box of candy or a bottle of whiskey or whatever it may be. Um, it, this, is, this downturn has been a lot worse and, uh, you know, it's affected us and, and so, um, you know, people just don't have the expendable income they, they've had in the past, and particularly on the western slope. I mean, we're, you guys are going into blowing again over here. And it's really impressive to see. You know, we're, there's, we're still hurting over on the west side. It's, it hasn't come back. And, but typically, we always lag uh, going into a recession, and then we lag coming out. And this time, we're really lagging, and you guys are, it's really exciting to see what's going on over here but we, we need some we need some activity on the western slope and we need some people to wake up and understand that we need this energy development we need the jobs and uh, you know it's also they need to understand some bridge fuel we can't you can't force the technology you've got to use this fuel now to get us to the new technology so it's 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 that whole economic puzzle that i think affects us in a lot of ways so. Colorado is a great place to start companies, but as they grow, uh, there's a pressure for them to move to other states that try to lure them away, or maybe even other countries. And obviously, Enstrom's been here many generations. And what keeps you here? And what would be your recommendation to not only attract companies, but to retain them in Colorado? Um, well, um, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we, uh, there's, there's a lot of history and a lot of tradition. Um, you know, they, they, uh, we're an icon business in western Colorado. And we've spent a, a lot of time and done a lot of hard work importing money over there and supporting those, uh, our community and stuff over there. So we, we are really uh, tied very closely to Grand Junction. Um, there's a there's an, uh, an art we have, we're very famous for art on the corner. If you've been over to Grand Junction in recent years, there's up and down uh, the, the the business core downtown on Main Street and what have you. There's wonderful art, and it's, we call it art on the corner. Well, the art on the corner committee came up with an idea to do what they call a legends project, and they're, so they're doing all the city fathers and they're doing business entrepreneurs and the, the sisters that started St. Mary's Hospital in, in Grand Junction, et cetera. Well, we're being honored in September with a, a one and a quarter life-size uh, statue of Chet and Vernie downtown for wow. Chet's involvement, Chet and Vernie's involvement in the community and the candy company and everything. So we have those ties and that's an emotional thing. And so um, we're, gonna, we're gonna continue to operate in Grand Junction, uh, but we have ties in Denver now too. So as we expand, you know, would we would we uh, have a, a satellite facility over here and expand over this way? I, there's there's one of the secret ingredients in our product here is something that uh, Colorado is one of the few states that has it, and it's altitude. And so we at altitude we can cook a very nice uh, fluffy toffee, and it's uh, and and so that's one of the uh, secret ingredients, if you will. So. We're, our, our, uh, you know, our, our stakes are down in Colorado. We're not leaving. We're going to participate in Grand Junction, and, and we, may, we may increase our presence on the front range as time goes on. I love your concept about the legacy of community service, and as a business owner, that's one of the great blessings, is to be able to give back and have a positive impact in the community. I'm a big believer that most people want to give, but may not know how to give. It's a learned trait like anything else, or they don't want to be taken advantage of. And maybe you could share just some of your insights to encourage others about the blessing of giving and maybe how they could get started, or some lessons maybe that you've learned. You know, we think, uh, I'll tell you, uh, no, we're kind of like at Main and Main in downtown Grand Junction. And we don't send anybody away empty-handed. They're either going to get cash, they're going to get some some expertise. We're going to participate. We'll go out and bang, ring doorbells and knock on doors and, and raise money, um, or at the very least, 
they're going to get candy for their silent auction, whatever it may be. Nobody gets turned away. And, you know, interestingly enough, when we were really down in the dumps early in, in, two, in the 2000s, um, you know, we have a pretty significant line of credit. When you're in a seasonal business, you have to build and build and build and build, build, build the inventory, and then you sell it all at once. And it takes a lot of money to put all that stuff away and store it, and then, you know, because it, it's, it's not continuous, it's highly seasonal. The mail order business, we do 80% of our business in November and December, and the sales anyway. The production is May through, May through November. So, um, during that period of time, we were still giving money away and supporting community causes and doing those things, even though we were borrowing it. And it's because that's who we are. It's what we do. We support people. So we support causes. Um, and, and whether it's lending your expertise sitting on a board and or at the same time uh, funding things out, asking other people to join you and leading by example, um, it's, just, it's just what we do. And it's the right thing to do. As you know, it, it's called compassionate conservatism. We are, we're kind of a conservative bunch. But, you know, we put our money where our mouth is, and it's important. Thank you. With that, we open up for questions to the group. Anyone? No questions? I've got one more question, then. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can wrap it up with that. So how many pounds or tons of sugar do you produce uh, or you manufacture in a given year? Um, in recent years, our, our production has been about three and a half million pounds annually, totally. And between between all the products that we do for our mail order business, over the years we've expanded the mail order. You'll see us doing you know truffles and turtles and and uh, peppermint cookie bark and a lot of the, the the you know things that we do. But you know even though we add all these other items, it's still 90% toffee. We're well known for toffee. We're gonna you know we're we're the best at it. It's the best product you can buy. It's got the best ingredients we can find to put in it. And we, we manufacture it with great care. And so, um, you know, we continue on. And it's kind of schizophrenic because the, the mail order business is direct to consumer. The, the wholesale side of the business is sometimes it's through distributors, but it's through that other retailer. There's a lot of people in there that want to take a piece of the pie on the way by. Uh, this is direct to consumer. This is very, uh, it's very special. It's, a, it's, a, a, it's the golden goose. We guard it very carefully. We nurture it as best we can. And, uh, uh, you know, so business is good. We continue to grow, and we're going to grow into the future. We've worked hard, you know. There's not a lot going on in Grand Junction for young guys. And so we've worked very hard to try to create a business that our, our, our next generation would be interested enough in to come and we have enough to do to keep their interest. And we've accomplished that. And, and the, the reason that we support Grand Junction and do all that we do over there is because we want a reason for our kids on the West Slope to have a reason to stay there and prosper. And we want to try to bring in the businesses and diversify the economy and give our kids a reason to, to be in Grand Junction. At Enstrom Candies, we've done that. Uh, the, the editor of the newspaper over there was, uh, the publisher of the newspaper over there was telling me, he says, we really got to work hard to give our, these kids that go into Colorado Mesa University a reason to graduate and stay here in Grand Junction and stuff. You know, and it's hard. I told him, I said, you know, we've worked hard to do that. We've created a business and grown it so that the next generation is interested. But, you know, it's not just about business, it's about community. There's got to be something to do. We've got a lot of mountain biking, we've got a lot of hiking, we've got a lot of fishing, we've got a lot of days of sunshine. But if there aren't people there out on the streets and, and something, some nightlife and some things like that going in a vibrant community, it's hard to attract these kids. And, you know, that's another reason that we, we do all we do. We're trying to grow that community on the Western Slope and, and, uh, and give our kids a reason to be there and prosper. So important. Thank you so much. Briefly, I want to mention our upcoming schedule. Next time at July 17th, we're going to have Dick Franklin, director of the Clean Tech Open and father of U.S. Olympian Missy Franklin. On August 21st, John Harple, who's the founder and president of Mercator Energy. On September 18th, we have Josh Stewart, the founder and CEO of XJet, one of the world's largest 
uh, private jet groups. And on October 16th, Bruce Benson, the president of the University of Colorado and the long, longest serving CU president in more than half a century. As we close out, again, I think from each of our speakers, we garner some golden nuggets of wisdom. And there's a couple of things that really jumped out from your talk, Doug, and I really appreciate it. And that is the legacy of community service. You see, oftentimes people believe that, well, business people or entrepreneurs, well, they're not really involved in things like community and supporting their community. And I would say the opposite is true, that these are the people who are employing individuals so that they can go achieve their dreams. These are the people who are reinvesting in the community. These are the people who are really making a positive difference. I also want to look at the other side. Oftentimes we always think about the success of things and things are supposed to always go well. But you said out of the ashes comes success, and I believe that. And I want to encourage each of you in your own lives to embrace those obstacles. Be thankful for those obstacles. They make us better. They make us stronger. And frankly, they make us more compassionate. So that when you're back up on that hill, you're always serving those around you and being a resource to them. So thank you all for coming tonight. Greatly appreciate it. And look forward to seeing you at future events.